look out across this land we love. There's freedom. It's an inherent American right. Police parade down streets, proud descendants of the slave patrol. All summer, my uncle can't sleep, and he was born free. And he ain't never been. We deserve a break. We deserve to laugh, talk shit, and scream. Most may now know the 19th of June is a time for celebration. <gasps> oh, happy Juneteenth! And while it may now be officially celebrated as America's newest national holiday, it's more than 150 years in the making. In Texas, the enslaved people were not allowed to practice their freedom until June 19th, 1865. And people will say, well, maybe they didn't get the, the news in time. Well, why were they late? They were late specifically because the planters needed to get another crop in the ground. Abraham Lincoln had already been assassinated by the time the slaves in Texas were freed. The day the news of emancipation finally reached the last of those in bondage is now the source of jubilee for black folks all over the country. And in Texas, where it all began, formerly enslaved families purchased Emancipation Park as a place to hold their annual celebration. So if Juneteenth marks the official end of American slavery, why is it just now becoming a marker in American history? So I think what people do is look back and say, well, you know, it was still hard after that. White governments brought in Jim Crow and tried to bring things back near as near to slavery as they could get it. The holiday and its meaning re-entered the national consciousness as we reflected on the life and death of George Floyd, a man born in Houston in the shadow of Emancipation Park. Because this day is about more than the emancipation of slaves. It's about passing down the history of a people. So join us this Juneteenth as we celebrate and continue the work of those who came before by honoring our traditions. Our many colors represent the shades of African American women. Investing in our communities and sharing the resilience and the joy that is the black experience. Hey everybody. As Revolt and Vice team up for the culture to present a second annual Juneteenth special, I'm your host, Mara Schiavocampo. First, a big shout out to our sponsor, Walmart, and their new program, Live Better You, which helps HBCU graduates tackle the complex challenge of preventing student debt. Now, let's get to business, more specifically, Black-owned business. In recent years, there's been a huge emphasis on supporting Black businesses, and Juneteenth is the perfect occasion to discuss why buying Black is so important. You might not think of Juneteenth as a shopping holiday, but maybe you should. On a day all about freedom and progress, black businesses have changed the game in ways worth celebrating. Black entrepreneurs have cornered the market in rap music, own one-tenth of the country's hotels, and since the pandemic have started more small businesses than at any time in the last 25 years. And buying black-owned does more than support business growth. It allows owners to invest in the communities and causes they serve. Today, as we commemorate Juneteenth, we're gonna highlight some good news in the black community, like how black businesses are hot and getting even hotter. But how do we close the wealth gap to reflect that? How the support of HBCUs in education has quadrupled, and with everything that's going on, we've got a hit on the mental health stigma and how we can help our brothers and sisters who are dealing with this issue. So let's get right to it. We have a lot to talk about, and we have a dope panel to talk about it with. They're going to help tell us why we should uplift black businesses on Juneteenth. Well, I'm sure most of you have heard of our first guest. She's been called the serial entrepreneur, Pinky Cole, founder and CEO of Slutty Vegan, who in just four years has five locations valued at $100 million. Another CEO you may know is comedian B. Simone from Wild and Out. She has funded her own beauty brand. She is also an author and a musical artist, quite the multi-hyphenate. We have Derek Hayes, founder of Big Dave's Cheese Steaks. He brought his Philly roots to Atlanta, serving 10,000 customers a week. 
Meet Dr. Lakeisha Hallman, known as Dr. Key. She founded the Village Market ATL in 2016. She served over 1,400 businesses and facilitated over $6.3 million of sales to black-owned businesses. And last but not least, Keon Davis, founder of Smooth and Groove, a smoothie and juice bar, which he started inside a gym. Thank you, everybody, for being here and for helping us celebrate Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> this is a great intro. <laughs> so, uh, Pinky, I want to start with you uh, because you are known as a serial entrepreneur. And we just got out of a really tough time as a country. We just came out of the pandemic. And that was really hard in particular for a lot of businesses. But your business grew. How did you do that? I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I started Slutty Vegan in 2018, and it was only supposed to be a ghost concept. So here I am, I have this concept that became very popular overnight, and then I realized that this is bigger than burgers, pies, and fries. Like, people really want to be a part of this movement. Mm -hmm. So as I continue to open up locations and do brand partnerships, I realized that I had something really special, and what I had was a weatherproof business. And I don't know if y'all ever heard of that before, but a weatherproof business is, it don't matter if it's raining, sleeting, snowing, hailing, your business will still thrive and be successful. So during the pandemic, at first, we were trying to figure out, like, what the hell is going on? What is a pandemic, right? So many of us were trying to figure out what it meant, how it would affect our businesses. And as a socially responsible entrepreneur, I knew that I had to make some really tough decisions. So I closed my business for about two weeks. And that was the best decision I ever made, because what it did is it allowed me the opportunity to really step back and recharge. And when I came back, oh, it was over with. Yeah. And when I say it was over with, I was able to open up at least three locations in the middle of a pandemic, Wow! grow my business 100% year over year. And unfortunately, most businesses can't say that, but I was fortunate enough to be able to create something that was building an ecosystem that could also help people and grow my brand to now $100 million. So I'm excited about Ooh, that. Oh, congratulations Thank on you. that. That is quite an accomplishment. Yeah. So since you are the boss, I want to turn this over to you because you are our business expert here. I wouldn't want you to lead this conversation and it's all family. So I'm going to let you take this portion away. Well, hey, y'all. Hey. So hi, guys. My name is Pinky. I'm your co-host. Girl, we know. <laughs> up, I just mama? had Slutty Vegan yesterday. Okay. <laughs> right. I've been eating Slutty Vegan for the last four years, as you can see. Um, so, you know, I am here with a few of my favorite entrepreneurs um, and I got to help handpick some of you because I think that you all represent something very special and it's that ecosystem that we get to build together in Atlanta, which is so cool because Atlanta is this black excellence mecca, right? Yeah. But oftentimes when we do panels like these, we just talk about like the pretty stuff, like the final product and like, yeah, it's good, but it's not always good. Yeah. So I want us to have an openly transparent conversation about what really happens behind the scenes in business because sometimes it gets a little difficult. And I think what separates us from everybody else is that we're able to rise above. So I want to start with the village market queen herself, Dr. Key, who is one of my very, very close friends. Um, Talk to us about what is the hardest advice that you've ever gotten and how you've been able to use that advice and apply it to your business to make it successful. Of course, you'll start with a hard question. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, friend. Yeah. Um, but I'm super happy to be here. Now, I believe that hard advice that I've gotten from mentors, even from families, that everybody can't go. Mm -hmm. um, when I first heard that I was in, in all of my naiveness and cup half full personality, that I'm going to take everybody. Yeah. And I remember my mentor saying, my grandmother saying, everybody won't be, on the, be at the end with you and half will cut off in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I think for entrepreneurs, it's very important to know that you got your starting team, the people that's going to help you out the gate. Mm -hmm. And then as you run the leg of the race, some people are going to fall off. Mm -hmm. You're going to be disappointed by some folks. Some people may uh, unfortunately get jealous of your climb. And then as you really are seeing at the apex of this journey, it's on a few folks up there. But then what I also learned from that advice is that when you get to that apex, you get new friends. You get the mm -hmm. pinkies of the world, the D's of the world. People will be there every leg of the journey. Yeah. So you, that heart can stay on your sleep, but no one's going to get knocked off. Mm. That's, that's yeah. a really important note because as we grow our business, myself especially, I realize that your team is only as good as the people that you choose. Yeah. So Derek, 
By the way, y'all know who Derek is. <laughs> I don't know. Does everybody know? <laughs> if you don't know, just look down. Where's the camera? Um, <laughs> we, heard his, we heard his interview already. <laughs> Derek, talk to us about, and I think that this is very important. Oftentimes, when we start small businesses, we do everything ourselves, right? Like, in the restaurant space, we're the fry cook, we flip the burgers, we shake the fries. But there comes a time where you have to stop working in the business and you got to start working on the business in order for it to grow. So talk to me about how you were able to do that and if there was any difficulty along the way and what advice would you tell other entrepreneurs who are in the middle of trying to figure out when do I leave, how long should I stay, and when is it time to really like let go and let go of control and grow my business? Um, well, that's a good question. Well, I think uh, first you got to start off with saying whether you want to be a worker or you want to scale your business because um, I sat with a billionaire and he said, if you could step out your business and, it, and, and people still would like your brand and it's still able to get the same popularity and people love the food, then you got something that will scale. Mm. Now for me, it was hard because I was the fried cook, I was the cashier, I was making cheesesteaks, I was halfway accounting, well, as much as I knew. But um, I think all realness of it is you have to be real with yourself and say, listen, I can't run this by myself. If people get used to just looking at me, the business can't grow. So I, I had to step out when I grew my downtown location. It was the hardest thing I had to do, like, you know, getting off the grill, because I was used to people saying, you know, Big Dave, you know, make the best cheesesteaks, and everybody walking up to me. But then I had to say, you know, I want my employees now to deliver the same quality of food that I started in 2014. And I think the hardest thing still today is getting people to take that same culture from location to location to location. And when you're able to do that, now you can scale your brand. So. Um, I think that's the hardest thing to do is walking out, especially when you are the face of your brand. But for me, it worked for me because I ain't, I ain't been, you know, making cheesesteaks in about so, a year now. So we're going to take a very quick break because okay. I want to hear more from everybody, including from the two guests that we have not heard from and more from you because there's a lot of knowledge here in this room and I want to get to all of it. So when we come back, how are the kids making money these days? And is it the same thing as actually building a sustainable business? I'm Kareem Webb, CEO of Fourth Movement and an entrepreneurial activist. One of the issues facing black Americans today is not getting our fair share of the pie. We deserve, we're 13% of the population, we should have 13% of the market share in every industry and the entire pie. I'm a retail operator. So in my business, we're helping people stand up businesses, financing them to operate proven concepts. What gives me hope for the future is the entrepreneurial vigor that I see all over the place and the commitment for people to be able to express their own ideas. And we're also beginning to see the ability to access more capital. We're here talking about business growth. And in just a second, we're going to talk about how younger generations are making money and what we can learn from them and maybe what they can learn from us. But before we get to that, I do want to finish the conversation that we were having. So I'm going to turn it over to Pinky, my illustrious co-host, um, to continue with our excellent panel. Well, you know, while we were on break, I was thinking about being disruptive as an entrepreneur. So I want to toss this question over to you, V. Um, if you have been living under a rock, you might not know who V. Simone is, but everybody else in the world knows who this amazing woman is. Stop. <laughs> Whether you see her on Wild and Out or see her as a boss lady on social media everywhere, you have really disrupted the influencer space um, in yeah. all things that you do. So I first want to commend you um, for you. just being a rock star. Um, one thing that I really like about you is that you don't give a damn. <laughs> and I'm like that as well. Yeah. Like, I'm a little raw on the tongue. Yeah. Like, I say exactly what I feel. Yeah. And I don't turtle myself for other people because yeah. I am who I am. Yeah. And you either gonna love it or leave it alone. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about how important it is to be authentically yourself yeah. when you are building a business as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Because oftentimes, there are people that are afraid to just be themselves. But I realize success really comes when you can just confidently show up as you. So talk to us about that. Yeah, well, that's what got me to this point I think that's what got all of us to this point even like today I was like can I cuss on here you know <laughs> but there's a time and a place I'm not going to be the same on wild and out as I am on a panel giving entrepreneurship advice there's a time and a place but you still have your personality and who you truly authentically are in every single moment in every aspect so that's what got me to this point People was like what's the secret to your success being myself mm -hmm. and, and truly truly walking in that and when you find yourself sometimes you change and evolve and it's okay your audience and the right people will catch on and they'll change and evolve with you 
So but when we're talking about authenticity, I saw all of you nodding. Yeah. <laughs> you're covered in tattoos. Yeah. Your hair is yeah. natural. Your yeah. hair is short. You're covered in tattoos. A yeah. few generations ago, none of you would have been welcome into the business space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keon, how have you found that showing up authentically as yourself has helped you? And when has it been a challenge? So for me, it, it all started like back in college, right? So I went to Tuskegee University and I was in a business house. So what we had to do is we had to wear business casual, mm. right? We had to have the right socks on, we couldn't have earrings, had to have ties going into business class. And as I, when I came out and when I graduated, I started my own company, when they would invite me back to speak, they like, hey, you know, you can't have your hat on. I said, mm. no, I'm gonna have my hat on. Mm. Wow. Right? They like, well, no, that's not business. I said, well, listen, the difference for me is, is that I run my own business, right? Yeah. No one can tell me how to dress. I dress for comfort, exactly. yeah. right? One of the things I do is it's all about comfort for me. So if I'm comfortable in a space, I'm gonna perform my best, right? I think Dion said that, you look good, you feel good. Yeah. You feel good, you play good. You play good, they pay good, right? Yeah. So I adopt that, that mentality when it comes to my business. So now my business is a direct reflection of how I feel every single day. So you're gonna get the hat to the back, I right? You're gonna get the polo <laughs> shirt, you're gonna get the shorts or whatever I feel comfortable in because I can do my best work in that space. And you know, that's when the smoothies taste yeah. the best because his smoothies, he got right. the best in there. <laughs> so good. I have another night yes. in <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, all of you have been phenomenally successful, and there are a lot of people watching this who want that kind of success. Um, and I'll just go down the line very quickly. But Pinky, I'll start with you. What is one thing you wish you had known when you started this journey? Mm. <laughs> Everything that I wish that I'd known, I've known. All the mistakes that I made, I'm glad that I made them. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. the speed bumps, the yeah. failures, the hiccups, none of that was failures or speed yeah. bumps at all. Um, and people ask me that question a lot. Like, what would you wish you have known? Would you have changed it? I wouldn't change nothing. Yeah. I wouldn't change a damn thing, actually, because life is really all a part of the journey, right? It's written, yeah. whether it looks ugly, whether it looks pretty. That story is already set in stone. And we are just on this wild, emotional roller coaster ride to get to where we're trying to go. And some people might want to get to the B. Some people might just want freedom. Yeah. Some people might want to just have generational wealth or impact people behind them. But whatever it is, that journey is already there, so you got to take the good with the bad, but it's never really bad. So I'm happy at what the journey looks like, and I'm just here for the ride. Yeah, the journey yeah. is an education. Mm -hmm. B, yeah. what would you have told your younger self? Um, I, I agree with Pinky, but I will say that worrying about the how and the when, just believe it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Like, start at A. I think everybody wants to know A through Z. How is it? Take the first step. Start with A. Once A is complete, go to B. Once B is complete, go to Z. You don't have to know the how and the when. Like, God got that. Mm -hmm. Just start. Say yes and commit and believe and, you know, each step will make sense. But if I can just very quickly follow up on that, a lot of people have the dream, but they don't have the means. So there's a question of money. If you have this dream and you want to know how to fund it, what is step uh, one? Hello. <laughs> I, and all of you probably a lot of our stories. Yeah, all of you built yeah. something. So yeah. how do you get to step one? How do you fund step one? And now step one is free. It's called social media. Yeah. Yes. We yeah. are in that era. Like if you have a phone, if you don't have a phone, use your homie's phone. You better start your Instagram on social media. I don't care if you're a dentist. You need to be on social media. It's like just the time. You have to evolve with times. That's yeah. just like saying, I don't want a cell phone. I'm going to write you a letter. <laughs> that don't make sense. Mm -hmm. doesn't make you, sense. You have to evolve with technology and time. So social media is free. I was making videos in my Toyota, three hubcaps, <laughs> no, like, like making videos, you know? So put yourself out there. The right people will come to you and they'll tell you what they want from you. Your yeah. audience will tell you what I, they want. I agree with you a thousand, yeah. thousand percent on that because when I started at my little gas station, I was just doing videos, yep. making cheesesteaks, letting yep. people see the, the real authentic side from me. You ain't seeing no fancy restaurant. You seeing this little, this little grill, this broken fryer. But you see a kid from West Philly that don't look like your average CEO with 40-some tattoos on his body, and you're like, damn, yep. the culture looking at you, you represent yep. something we need. And I think that's what sells your story when you have something and it's authentic, it don't matter what you're selling because your story is the biggest sell. And right. you don't need money to do that. No, right. and you don't need money to do that right. at all. Right. Yeah. So you need the talent, the drive, the yeah. creativity. Uh, Dr. Key, what do you wish you would know when you started? Um, before I answer that, I, I think another thing that's free is work ethic. Mm -hmm. you, that's the thing that we innately have. So if social media isn't there, if the fryer isn't there, you got to have something inside of you every single day yeah. to consistently believe in yourself. Absolutely. Um, but the thing that I would have told myself uh, 20 plus years ago is that there is no perfect start. I'm a recovering perfectionist. 
I'm mm -hmm. the type that every, wow. every day I'm What's the program for recovering wow. perfectionists? I need to take a roll. <laughs> That's a class. I'm, yeah. I'm class. still stuck in it. Yeah, I'm a recovering perfectionist. That it, but it's what B said, that you, don't, that you don't have to be at Z when you start. Yeah. That every single day as you learn is a step to getting what you want. But I think so many uh, people get paralyzed in the thought process of beginning because they start thinking about all the things that they do not possess. Mm. What I learned is I had the idea that's the gift in itself. Yep. Yep. There are people every single day waking up, literally starving for ideas. Yep. And we all have yep. one. We got them. Yep. And we yep. got them. And then we had the gumption and the know-how to actually get going. Because before you got on social media, I'm sure it was an inner voice inside of you 100%. that made you question it. yourself yeah. mm -hmm. and said either do or mm -hmm. don't. And what's amazing, these people here, we did the do more than we did the don't. Right. Yeah. So the, what I would tell myself 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago, you do not have to be perfect, and you need to trust that genius vision that you have. Yeah. Keon, your big lesson? Man, mine was more like, I was an athlete, right? And so I'm very competitive. And so one of the things that got me was, I used to ride down the street, and I would see all these businesses, right? None of these businesses was anybody that I can go speak to. None of these mm -hmm. businesses was anybody that I even known, right? But the competitive side of me was like, if they start it, I can do it. Yeah. Every yeah. business start the same way. Yep. I got an idea. I got the balls to go do this job. Yep. I'm going to yep. figure it out, right? Mm -hmm. So I will ride past Walmart. And I'm like, all right, cool. Sam Walton, if we lined up side by side, I'll outwork him every day of the week, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I don't care what his, I don't care what his, his situation mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. I can outwork him every day of the week, right? It's going to be a tough one with me, right? Mm -hmm. So if Sam Walton can create a billion dollar industry over multiple generations, then why have I not started, right? right? The same mm -hmm. thing with McDonald's and any other company that you think of. So for me, I was like, you know what? I got an idea. I had plenty of ideas. I got books from when I was a child. When I was in eighth grade, I said that I'm gonna have a private jet with my face on it so you can know that it was mine, right? When I was in eighth grade, you know? And so all those things, those beliefs and those wants and those hungers that I had within myself, I knew that if I just started something, That's right? Mm -hmm. If I started something, I will figure out along the way what I need to do to kind of piece that puzzle yeah. together. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, all of you are so clearly committed to giving back. And Pinky, you gave back recently in a very unique way. Pinky was this year's commencement speaker at Clark Atlanta University. And you shocked the graduates when you announced that you would be giving everyone their own LLC. Wow. What was the reaction like? Crazy. It, it was amazing um, for, for so many reasons, you know. To be able to go back to my alma mater and give back in the way that I did, that was the best feeling in the world. Felt better than money. And hopefully they use that as a path to entrepreneurship to follow their wildest dreams. And that's an, yeah. it's an amazing start. And you're an amazing woman. And all of you are wonderful entrepreneurs. My name's Yvonne Allo. I'm the co-founder and managing partner of venture capital firm New Age Capital, where we focus on investing in seed stage technology startups, founded and led by Black and Latino entrepreneurs. One of the biggest issues facing Black Americans today very much has to do with why my partner and I started our fund, uh, and that's the lack of funding going to Black entrepreneurs. We're supporting the best Black entrepreneurs coming out of the country. We're giving them the right funding, we're giving them the right resources, and we're putting them on a path to success so that they will be building the next generation's billion dollar public companies. Um, and that trickle down effect from their success and their economic prosperity um, will only grow within our community. And as long as we're continuing to open doors and make sure the opportunities are available for folks, um, you know, there's gonna be great things to come. So here's towards the next 100 uh, billionaire black founders. So as we continue talking business, we wanna focus now on closing the wealth gap, what that really means and how to actually achieve it. Joining us now is Tarek Brooks, president of Combs Enterprises. But before we get to that conversation, let's take a quick look at why it's essential to close the wealth gap. I think the racial wealth gap speaks to the fact that we still have a long way to go to achieve ideals of equality in this country. The richest 400 American billionaires have more total wealth than all 10 million black households. Such disparity generations in the making as blacks were held back from owning land and building equity over generations while white families built wealth that grew and grew. This is something that started with slavery, but it's never diminished over time. And that's because government policy keeps perpetuating the circumstances for the wealth gap. The racial wealth gap is a measure of the white family and the African-American family that's right smack dab in the middle, the median. The median white household has a net worth 10 
times that of the median black household, $171,000 to $17,600, a difference that's growing with the total racial wealth gap a startling $10.14 trillion. It amounts to $840,900 on average between a black and white household. It's like if you're black in this country, you have to be like, well, what the hell? What's up with us? Closing the wealth gap is vital and must address issues like lower wages, higher unemployment, and housing discrimination among black populations, as well as reparations. How do you close this gap, this huge gap in wealth between whites you and don't. blacks? Reparations. Right? Reparations. How much are we talking about here, ta Well, we don't actually know, although I, I will take Good. a check okay. on behalf of myself. <laughs> I think reparations have to happen for black people, you know what I mean? Because slavery was America's original sin. And I really don't think no good is going to come to this country until they atone for their original sin, which was slavery. Tarek, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you join this conversation, um, especially with your expertise in the business world, because you are the president of Combs Enterprises. That includes a lot of different businesses in different industries. So based on your experience in the business space, what do you think are the top ways to start closing this wealth gap? Thank you very much for ha having me. I'm happy to be here and be a part of such an important discussion. Um, I, I think it's important for the black community to realize that there are, there are really two issues. There is the ability of our community to, to create wealth, and then there is closing the wealth gap. I think there are a lot of things that we can do as a community that will help close the wealth gap and create wealth, uh, including um, better habits around investing and uh, creating assets that appreciate in value. Uh, home ownership is a, is a key factor in creating wealth. In fact, it's the kind of biggest factor that most Americans use to create wealth. Um, and I think what we need to also recognize is that to close the wealth gap, um, we are going to deal, we're going to have to deal with things that have been institutionally put in place that created the wealth gap in the first place, right? The wealth gap is a result of systematic, um, economic, racially biased policies and, and, and that, that have affected our community in ways that have set us behind. And so now the burden is, is on us to figure out how we build wealth uh, to be able to work, work our way back to parity. Um, and, that, and that wealth gap has a, a real impact on the economy. Um, McKinsey suggests that the, the economic impact of the wealth gap on the U.S. is about one to one and a half trillion dollars. Uh, and so it's, it's a problem that affects all of us. And when we talk about what that looks like on an individual level, one of the, the themes that resonated with the panel here, all entrepreneurs, was the idea of operating authentically, being your authentic self, um, and what that means in a business space, especially as a black entrepreneur. What's your experience in terms of authenticity in the entrepreneurship world, in the business world, as a black man? Yeah, so black entrepreneurship is key to, to creating wealth for our community. One, because uh, as an entrepreneur with ownership, with equity, you are able to capture more of the value that is created by the business that you own, right? And that, that is a, a wealth accumulation vehicle. Uh, black entrepreneurs are also able to be intentional about who they hire, about the vendors they use. So they are able to drive where dollars are going every day. At Combs Enterprises, more than 63% of, uh, of the businesses we do business with are black owned. And that is very intentional. We also have an extremely diverse workforce. And so we are able to do that because we are a black led business and you know the way things should work if we are able to help uh encourage folks to circulate our dollars throughout our community uh we are able to uh, first spend money with our vendors those vendors are able to spend money by hiring black employees uh and also working with additional black firms and that's how you get dollars to move through our community in a great way um, right now when you look at the statistics um, a dollar that goes into other communities, you know, the Asian American community, the Jewish American community, stays in that community for 20 to 30 days. A dollar that comes into the black community right now stays in uh, for less than six hours, right? So we need to be very intentional as entrepreneurs uh, about authentically owning that we want to help our communities and do that by ensuring that dollars move through our community um, with, with, with more frequency and stay in our community longer. 
Um, I want to bring the panel back in now. One thing that I found really interesting about our conversation is that you all weren't focusing on, you know, how to get a loan, on the, the nuts and bolts. What you all have talked about, by and large, is inspiration, conquering fear, trusting your instincts, and having other people in your circle that can support you on this journey. Dr. Key, you say that support is a verb. What do you mean by that? Um, support being a verb is if you are behind black businesses, if you are behind black communities, if you are behind black education, black resources, it should be some action behind that. Mm. So beyond talking about it, what does your doing look like? Uh, and for me, that doing has to be tangible. So I believe if you support black businesses, I should look at your receipts at the end of the month and how much of that went to a black business. I should see if you have children and things that I empower my friends who are mothers to do. Is that a black pediatrician? Are these black schools or black organizations that mm. you're feeding your kids into? And how you start making sure that dollar recycles in a community longer than six hours, it lasts for six hours because we're spending in one place and then we go somewhere else to spend again. Mm. And so it, that circulation stops. So if you're spending in the morning, who are you spending with at lunch? Who's the person that's cutting your, cutting your yard? Who's the person that's shaping up your beard? Who's fixing a roof at your house? All of these things, we can start building and circulating the dollar in our community that will last what it used to do in the days of Tulsa, within months, the, wow. the dollar stayed in our communities because we were segregated and we were forced to build and do for self. But any time in this, in this country, when, when it works for us, when, when the model that was meant to break us down we created so many black millionaires in what happened. Bombs were drop, uh, dropped on those communities. And at the end of that, all these black millionaires had insurance. They were not allowed their insurance claims. Wow. So there's a reason behind that six hours. I love that's that, but I also love to talk about the roots. Because when we talk about the six hours, we're talking about the system, uh, the symptoms of systemic racism. Mm. You know, one of the things I always think about when, I, when we talk about Tulsa is the effect that's had, that's had generationally. You know, what impact would that wealth have had mm. over the years oh, with God. interest yeah, on the amazing. children and the grandchildren right. of all of those who lost all of that wealth? It's, it's really important because intergenerational wealth is also something that is not equal in black communities as it is in others. Um, I do want to quickly go back to some specifics and one thing that you mentioned, B, and you talked about social media. Mm -hmm. And you are a social media star. You have done what so many people today, especially young people, aspire to do. You have created a massive social media audience mm -hmm. that, that is coming to you for content in two huge industries, beauty and fitness. You've yeah. turned it into a business. Yeah. How do you grow your following to the point where you have numbers that can actually make you some money and how do you monetize your following yeah I just put out organic raw real content how mm -hmm. and that's why it's sometimes hard for me to put out content because I put out content based off my emotion and how I feel and my assistant gets mad at me all the time she's like you need to post today I'm like it's not organic do you today. plan it I don't you don't have like a I'm, scheduler and I, time absolutely post not. And I yeah. post when I feel it so mm -hmm. I think that is a part of me posting in real time and being authentic and being relatable. People can relate to my fitness journey because I showed it. I showed it from a year ago when I started it to now, a year later, it, it wasn't overnight, it wasn't a 30 day quick thing. It was people watching me through the struggle and I think people are scared to show their vulnerability and their struggle mm. and that's what's most relatable to mm. the audience. Mm. So how do you get over that fear? Because it is very scary. It you're not, is. You're putting yourself out there. It so is. So if people reject it, they're rejecting you. I think it starts with self love. It really does. It starts with owning Absolutely. who you are, yeah. loving who you are, mm -hmm. and excuse my language, if you're not an effed up person, you should be able to walk <laughs> in that truth. If you are, you know, yeah. change some things, but if you are a good person and you know your intentions are pure, walk in that. It starts with you loving you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and yeah. Uh, and speaking of authenticity, that's something that we frequently hear from, uh, you know, Combs Enterprises. Yeah. Um, Tarek, how, talk about authenticity and how important it is to the Combs brand and why you think it's so crucial today to have that as a component of any business. Yeah, I would argue one of the things that, that has been a, a major driver to Sean Combs' success is, is his authenticity. Um, it, he, he is very um, deliberate about not putting out a product, whether that's um, uh, music, you know, one of our spirits brands, content on remote that he doesn't genuinely believe in. Yep. And what being an entrepreneur has enabled him to be able to do is dictate, you know, the things he does and does not do based on what's authentic to him. And so one of the things that as, as the president of the company, I'm very proud of is there's nothing that we do. There's nothing that we put into the market that we don't genuinely stand behind uh, and, and are proud of. And, and, and that's what 
being an entrepreneur enables one to be able to do. It enables you to be your authentic self and, and, and open up that opportunity. Well, and everyone on this panel certainly is an example of that, of being authentic and having that be tremendously successful in business and, you know, also making a little money while you're at it. So yeah. congratulations to all of you <laughs> on that. You. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. Thank you to our panel. When we come back, we're going to get real about an issue that is affecting our communities across the country. We're confronting our discomfort with mental health challenges and removing the stigma once and for all. My name is Charles Booker, former state representative here in Kentucky and the first black candidate to be a major party nominee for U.S. Senate. And I believe the largest issue, the biggest issue facing the black community is structural inequity and structural racism, which is most evidenced in generational poverty and the consistent injustices that we see across the country. And I'm doing my part to address that right now, focusing on policies like Medicare for All, universal basic income, financial freedom, and ensuring reparations, and making sure that we address environmental injustices and the challenges that have plagued our communities. And my hope is being restored because a coalition is growing from the hood to the holler based on our common bonds because the fight for liberation and healing for the black community will uplift all of us. According to the National Alliance on Mental Health, one in three black adults who need mental health care actually receive it, only one in three. Some of that may stem from racism or simply a lack of resources. Recently, the headlines have been inundated with stories about families grieving about the loss of loved ones due to suicide. More than 80% may experience shame and worry that they could be discriminated against because of their illness. So we often don't talk about these things or seek help. The stressors of a global pandemic and the nation's racial reckoning have shed new light on the issue of mental health for black Americans. But as a generation dealing with isolation and depression grows more open about their struggles, longstanding stigmas put them at risk in their hour of need. In recent years, suicide rates have increased dramatically for black adults in the U.S., a trend that's only continued since the start of the pandemic. It's a heartbreaking but preventable epidemic and a cure that starts with confronting the taboo of mental illness in the black community. How do we eradicate that stigma? Well, to discuss that, we have a great panel who can address the real on combating mental illness. Joining us from LA is the illustrious Grammy-winning singer-songwriter, Michelle Williams. Psychologist, Dr. Ebony Butler is here with us in the studio. Producer, director, Corey Knott. Marketing guru, Angel Barnwell, whose mental health platform is called Smile Ho, H-E-A-U-X. And also joining us virtually is Ty Tribbett, who you know as a Grammy-winning gospel singer and songwriter. Michelle, I want to start with you, because this is something you have been very public and vocal about. You have two books, Checking In, How Getting Real About Depression Saved My Life and Can Save Yours, and The Daily Check-In, A 60-Day Journey to Finding Your Strength, Faith, and Wholeness. You have been so open about depression and suicidal thoughts and the lessons that you've learned about prioritizing your mental health. Tell us about that journey. Uh, the journey started um, in 2013 is when I first talked about it publicly. Um, I didn't think it would make that portion of the interview. I thought it was kind of off the record, but nothing's really off the record. Um, but I was okay. I mean, I trusted the journalist, but I just thought he wasn't even going to add that um, to part of the interview. And once it became public, it was it was it was a lot. And um, I just was kind of regretful. Did I do the right thing? But a few people pulled me to the side and thanked me, specifically men, thanked me for sharing the story. And I said, you know what? Because men don't normally respond or share. Um, they are more now, but even in 2013, many men weren't sharing or talking about um, depression publicly. It's something that people have been dealing with silently. So ever since then, it's been something that I've been talking public about. Fast forward to 2018, I had to check into a treatment facility. Um, and again, uh, something I wasn't ready to talk about publicly yet, but a particular platform, by the time they know what's going on, you kind of have to say something. Um, and that's what happened. And I've been, I, I don't have any shame about it. And I think that it is helping. Um, you talk about how to eradicate stigma is just people being open and honest. 
Not everybody has to shout it from the rooftops like I do, but maybe someone uh, who works alongside of you, you can share your journey with them. And that can help eradicate stigma little by little. Yeah, those conversations are so important to have. And Dr. Ebony, you have made it easier for people to have these conversations by creating my therapy cards. What are those? So my therapy cards are a deck of cards that I actually created out of a need, actually. So as a psychologist in Texas, I was actually the only PhD in the city, which is a problem, the only black woman practicing. So I wanted to be able to help people have access to better questions, not just affirmations while I love them. I think that we need to put the, act, uh, the questions in the hands of people who can do some real work. So I took the questions that I ask clients in my everyday practice and I put them in the card deck. And I wanted black folks to have permission to do work in the mental health field. A lot of people don't know that the mental health field actually started out with, for black folks as a way to decriminalize us. So I wanted people to actually be able to do some quality work and work against stigma, work against cost, work against access. I wanted it to be more affordable because therapy is expensive. And I wanted people to be able to use questions and have access to questions that a real therapist is asking because of geographical limitations, everybody can access a therapy, mm -hmm. a therapist. So I wanted that to be the case. And so we created the deck for women, and then we created the deck for black girls, and then we created the deck for black men. For black men. So mm -hmm. speaking of black men, Corey, hey. you are known for being a great dancer, for personifying black boy joy, mm -hmm. um, but you have also gone through some hard times, um, and one situation in particular. Um, tell us about that particular circumstance and how it affected you. Sure. Um, um, I'm also a producer, so I was in LA filming in 2019, and I was set up at gunpoint. And I remember, you know, all the conversations that I had with this particular person. I was like, oh, you know, I'm giving them information, I'm giving them nuggets, I'm giving them, you know, um, you know, just different things what they can do to further their career because we went to, we were in the same department in college, but he just dropped out. So I'm just thinking, you know, things are still the same way. Fast forward 15 years later, they're not, and so people um, just have different. You know, they go through different paths in life and takes them to different directions. And this particular time, um, I was giving him you know, how I made my way, how I made my money, how I did things, um, how to get your own app, just different things that, you know, that as a black man that you can share with other black men because we don't have those network of resources. It's very hard, so you have to kind of worm your way in. And so when that happened, I remember coming outside and getting ready to get in the vehicle, and then all of a sudden in broad daylight, I was robbed by two people, and then I remember them saying, where's the money? So you were my, robbed at gunpoint. At gunpoint, mm-hmm. And I had a camera in my hand, because you know we were getting like BTS as we were going out, just getting some stuff, and then I remember him saying, um, you know, uh, where's the money yet? But then if I have a whole digital camera in my hand, you're not gonna ask for money, you're gonna ask for the camera, so already I knew that I was set up. So fast forward to the person who set me up, you know, as a black man, uh, we already have a target on our backs, but then being black and gay is another, so those, um, what happened, I kind of bottled it in, and then it wasn't until I was um, <clears throat> I was grieving someone, and then it came out later on down the road, but it, it goes to show that we don't talk about anxiety enough, we don't talk about depression, and it seems to seep out at the wrong times, causing a, a yeah. bigger spiral effect. And, and it speaks to the way trauma stays with us. So Ty, I also want to talk to you about a dark time that you experienced, and this was a little bit different. This was during your marriage. What happened? Oh, uh, I have many dark times uh, growing up. I grew up in a very religious sect, a very religious household. My dad was a pastor. My mom was like the choir director and all that stuff. So I'm the PK. So the expectation of perfection was over my life. So that's where a lot of my anxiety started growing up in the church and trying to be perfect for God and perfect for the church and perfect for every young person at the church. You're the example. You're this. So. A lot of my anxiety started from, from fear and just trying to please everybody. And then in school, I was the, the black buck tooth boy who was skinny. And so I was bullied at school a whole lot. So I didn't like substitute teachers. I didn't like going to the next grade. So I had a lot of anxieties and stress uh, on, a, on a level that I didn't even realize before I even got married. Uh, so that wasn't the darkest time of my life, but that's just a, a time that people know about. And so once I got married, my wife experienced what we postpartum. Everybody knows about postpartum now. I was like 23. I got married at 21. My wife was 18, so we didn't know nothing about postpartum. I just knew my wife had an attitude, and she ain't <laughs> like me no more. And we, we probably ain't going to make it because she tripping. That's all I knew. <laughs> uh, that's all I knew at that time. I didn't understand postpartum. I didn't understand any of that. I wasn't educated on that. I just knew how to praise God and sing and all that stuff. 
So, uh, uh, of course, that, that opened doors for other uh, temptations, and I fell to that temptation, and that was a very dark season of our life. My wife and I were separated for a few months. Uh, so that anxiety and stuff really, really increased in, in my life as well. Depression, suicidal thoughts, all of that. And the way I made it out, I mean, I got a relationship with God, and I think that is very imperative and important. But along with the relationship with God, he puts people in your life. And I feel like if I didn't have literal physical people around me, I would have done some harm to myself that I probably wouldn't have been able to bounce back from. So I thank God for him, and I thank God for the positive people around me that kept me up. Yeah, well, speaking of positive people, Angel, smile ho. Every time I say it, I smile. How did you come up with this, and what is your mission? The origin of Smile Ho comes from me having a mirror bitch moment from Issa Rae. And I didn't realize... A, a mirror bitch moment. A mirror bitch... So yourself in the mirror with me. Yes, so okay. Issa Rae has a mirror bitch moment. Um, she's in the mirror with herself. And I was having my own moment. And that was a phrase that I said to myself, that's the origin. And then miraculously, it just hit me one day in October last year. I was like, I'm going to use this as the name because there's a lot of meaning behind it for me. So now I'm going to start connecting to dot, the dots so that everyone else understands what smile hole means. So what is the mission? So the mission is to eradicate the stigmas around mental health in the black community because there are so many of us that are here that are rallying behind the need for the awareness, the awareness for the illnesses, and also the care. So people can feel good about themselves. I want people to feel good about themselves. So now I'm going to start screaming it from the mountaintops from a consumer viewpoint that this is what I want for myself and this is what I want for my community. Eradicating the stigma is a big part of seeking mental health treatment, and it's often an issue that we face in the black community. So I want to ask each of you, what do you think we can do as individuals to start getting rid of that stigma in the community so people feel more comfortable coming forward? Corey, I'm going to start with you. Uh, have the conversation, therapy, finding someone that you can trust. Um, you can't trust too many people, but that one person that you can, um, there's just different ways to cope with it. And I think by have, starting with a conversation is the best part. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ebony? I think it has to start with therapists as well. I, a lot of people put the onus on consumers to eradicate the stigma, mm -hmm. but I think therapists have to do a better job at how we talk about mental health and the ways that we talk about receiving our own mental health care and talk about diagnosing, talk about the insurance companies, talk about the pitfalls so that people know what we know so that they'll be better informed as consumers. Ty, what's one way that people can work on reducing the stigma in our community? Yeah, I agree with everybody else. Having the conversation with you, with, you know, with the people that are dealing with it, you know, getting into their thoughts and understanding where it's coming from, getting to the root of it. A lot of the, a lot of the mental illness and a lot of things that we suffer from, there's a root to it that probably stems from our child childhood, from a lot of unmet needs that we weren't fulfilled with as a child, and so we've had to develop as adults on our own, and we've had to commit soul suicide, and we had to kill a lot of desires since they weren't met as a child. So once you understand the root of a lot of these situations. You have patience for the people, a little more compassion for the people. And again, our faith cannot be excluded. Yes, have the conversations. Yes, have the therapy. But our faith has to be the backbone of the restructuring and the reimagining what this whole thing looks like. We got to keep the faith as well. And Michelle, I'm going to give you the last word on this. And as also as a woman who's spoken very publicly about your faith, how important that is to you, if you're talking to a faith-based community, which is so many of us, what would you say about reducing the stigma within that community? There are uh, some of my sheroes um, who are licensed ministers, but they're also licensed clinical social workers and therapists. You've got Dr. Anita Phillips uh, and Dr. Tama Bryant. Uh, what I would say to the faith-based community is to let people know, listen, a therapy does not replace Christ. You can, you know, I love when I'm um, Dr. Anita Prayer is a weapon. Therapy is a strategy. Um, so there are times where before I'm having a therapy session, I'll pray about it. And then after that therapy session, there have been many times where I've been like, okay, God, you heard what she said. You know, um, what are the next steps? So therapy does not reduce the God in me. It it, it, it doesn't. It, it doesn't... Um, uh, see, we're going to go into a whole conversation that probably should be held separately just for people of faith because sometimes we were just taught to pray about it. You know, just pray about it. And a lot of times you sweep stuff under the rug and you, you might go to the altar, but you're still going home to dysfunction. 
you know. So that's a whole nother summit, a whole nother special for revolt. Well, but I, but I love the point that you make, that the two things are not exclusive. You can do both. You can do faith and you can do therapy. Um, I want to give people it's, some resources, yeah. uh, Dr. Ebony. Um, you know, there is a unique circumstance to being black in America. Mm -hmm. Everybody has mental health struggles, but mm -hmm. ours are unique. What are some of the issues that are unique to the black community, and how can people find a black therapist if that's important to them? Absolutely. We struggle with uh, being strong, being weak, feeling like therapy is going to reduce our faith. So we have a lot of depression, we have a lot of guilt that we carry, that's conditioned guilt, um, and that we tend to feel shame around as well. I, I call guilt and shame cousins. Typically when we experience guilt, we will experience shame, and we are all the time feeling that. And a lot of that, like Ty shared, is rooted in childhood. Some of it is rooted in church. And a lot of us have to figure out how to, how to separate those. And I think people can, can really help themselves out if they were to work with this as adults. And so I would send people to therapyforblackgirls.com the Loveland Foundation. And of course, you can pick up my therapy cards to begin to gain some insight into what you need to work on. What are some of those issues that are lying dormant that you see come out when you're triggered? That's the way to begin to do the work. And you go in as an educated consumer, and you say, hey, I need to work on this. I know this about myself. And the journey becomes a lot easier. All wonderful information. Thank you all for your time. This is such an important conversation to have. And Michelle, you're right. We could have many, many more about this topic. Uh, coming up next, we're going to talk about the importance of HBCUs and the difference that they are making in the black communities. Hey, everyone. My name is Carly Jackson, and I am a marine biologist studying sharks and sea turtles. I am also a co-founder and the director of communications for a nonprofit called Minorities in Shark Sciences, or MISS for short. I believe that exposure and access to certain resources and subjects is a pressing issue in Black America today. And we at MISS are addressing this issue by creating opportunities geared towards Black Americans so that others can look at us and say, hey, I can do that too. So I am really hopeful for our future because we are partnering with a lot of organizations so that we can create a more equitable pathway into shark and marine science. So I am really excited to see the next generation of hopefully little black marine biologists out there doing great things for our ocean. We now turn our attention to the important tradition of historically black colleges and universities, a source of great pride and joy that we must protect at all times. From Howard to Hampton, from Bowie State to Bethune-Cookman, America's HBCUs have shared a mission since their founding to keep knowledge within reach. Providing affordable education for black students hasn't always been easy. The underfunding goes back to literally the existence of these schools. But after years of being on the brink, it's safe to say HBCUs are back, setting records with enrollment numbers and getting huge financial gifts from donors. McCord Maker, five-star recruit, is committing to an HBCU. And recruiting some of the nation's most talented collegiate athletes. It's a surge in interest historically black colleges haven't seen since the 90s. When a little show about a fictional college put HBCUs on the map. Today, HBCUs continue to have a reach and a responsibility that extends far beyond their campuses. Meet our guests now who have been fueling the surge of HBCUs and the importance of education. Joining us virtually, we have Dr. Steve Perry, who has been a champion fighting for disadvantaged children and families for more than 30 years. Here in the studio, Kiza Foster, Assistant Vice President of Institutional Advancement at Clark Atlanta University. King Randall is the 22-year-old who founded the X for Boys Life Preparatory School in Albany, Georgia, and Corey Arvinger, CEO of Support Black College Brand. Thank you all for joining us, Corey. I should also add that you are an entrepreneur, a media strategist, and the CEO of the clothing line Support Black Colleges. Dr. Perry, I'd like to start with you because you say something that's very instructive. You talk about how the success of life is determined by where you end, not where you start. What do you mean by that, and what role does education play in that? First of all, I'd like to thank Revolt for taking the time to discuss this very important topic. The impact of historical black colleges cannot be uh, overstated. It, what I mean by that is that we don't get to determine to whom and where we are born, but through opportunities such as education, we can enrich our lives and change the trajectory of not just our lives, but those of many others. And there is no set of institutions more effective at changing the trajectory of people's lives than historically black colleges. 
Um, and Kiza, when it comes to protecting those institutions, you know, funding is very important. Um, and you talk specifically about the importance of alumni funding. Why is that so important? Well, it's very important because as alum, I, I work at Clark Atlanta University, but I'm also an alum of Clark Atlanta University. And most alumni have a great affinity. You know, when you talk about um, HBCUs throughout the country, people lead with, I went to an HBCU, they support um, the HBCU brands. So we need to turn that support into funding because most of our um, HBCUs rely on the support of their alums. So alumni support is very important and alumni giving is very important. And across the country, it's about five to eight percent, which is very low. So if we could turn the affinity into support, then our HBCUs can thrive um, much longer. And King, you founded your school when you were just 19 years old. I mean, you're still such a young man um, doing such important work. Why was it important for you to do that so early in life? And what's your mission with the school? Uh, well, for most of the young men where I live in Albany, Georgia, they don't get a chance to see possible, uh, especially, um, you know, just around their local community. Uh, most of them get to see success from the, their rappers or the football players or athletes, etc. One of my classmates, uh, his, his brother, um, actually, uh, he killed someone. And um, my classmate actually went to jail for 30 years for hiding a weapon and he wasn't even there. Um, and that kind of stuck out to me because we don't have any true recidivism programs uh, where I live um, aimed at keeping the children out of jail. We have functional family therapy, but they only meet once a week um, and for three months. And I don't think that is true uh, rehab for our students, you know, and our boys in our community. So I started teaching young men uh, how to work on cars and houses, uh, how to te teaching them how to grow their own food, teaching them about family. Um, as I did that, I discovered many of the young men didn't know how to read. Um, and write, um, and many of them were uh, ages 11 to, and 11 to 17. Um, so that st stuck out to me, and I told them at the time, I didn't know how I was gonna do it, but I was gonna start them a school one day. Um, and here we are, you know, 2022, about to open our boarding school for boys, uh, August 3rd. The work that you're describing, I would expect to be hearing from someone in their 50s or 60s. I mean, you were 22 and you have already done so much. Where does that come from in you? Because as you say, in your community, you saw so much lack in terms of vision. Where does your vision come from? Um, well, I credit that to being raised by a full family. Um, I think that's extremely important uh, for just our, you know, the black community in general. We need to get that full family back um, because it, it wasn't a surprise when Dr. King them started their, their movements at 20-something years old. Fred Hampton was killed at 21. All these, you know, our main leaders started so young. Booker T. Washington, uh, who started uh, Tuskegee, this is my biggest inspiration. But these people started young, but now it's, it's like a, it's, it's it's crazy to see when somebody young is doing something. I'm just like, we all should have been doing something, you know, uh, young instead of people saying, well, why aren't you out in the club? Why don't you drink or smoke? You know, so those are things uh, that I talk about uh, pretty often. So, uh, Corey, I want to talk about your clothing line. Why, why did you start this clothing line and what is the mission with it? Yeah, definitely. I think it was extremely important to start it. When I got to Howard University, I realized that I didn't really know what the HBCU experience was about. My mom went to Howard, she always talked about it, but I didn't really understand truly. So my first day on campus from being from Greensboro, North Carolina, moving to Washington DC to the Mecca, it was an eye-open experience. I saw so many black people, people that looked like me that were valedictorians, salutatorians, voted most popular, whatever it might be. And I didn't know that existed from my small city. So once I saw it, I was like, I need everybody to know about this, but I wanted to go from a different approach, not necessarily like, oh, just go to a college fair or let's just talk about it online. Like, let me put it in a tangible way you can see it and actually feel it and touch it and then also be a walking billboard. And that leads us right to our mission, which is to get our kids back to our schools. If you look at like all these athletes, they're starting to go to HBCUs and commit. And that's how it was before with the Michael Strahan's and people like that. And you got people like Deion Sanders that's now, you know, coaching at an HBCU and a bunch of other guys. And our mission is literally to get our kids back to our schools schools, get our people back to our schools, get the funding back to our schools so that we can have that same opportunity to compete, whether it's academically or on, on the field. And Dr. Perry, we have seen this resurgence in recent years in terms of applications to HBCUs, a number of applicants, um, grants and funding. Why do you think we're seeing this now and what needs to be done to keep this going? Which is both good and bad because as a uh ahead of schools of, of schools in capital prep schools in Connecticut and New York, it's actually become a bit more competitive to get into some of the schools. Some of the schools that we anticipated 
uh, our young people would be able to get into with certain GPAs has actually raised the, the rising tides has raised all ships. And it's super important because where we are now is we're at a time when African Americans are still fighting some of the same remnants of racism. And many of our young people need to be in schools where they're seen as whole by virtue of the fact that they are there. It's not just enough at, at Capital Prep, which is the schools that we founded and run, for our scholars to go on to college. Every single one of our students must apply to at least one historically black college because our students call our schools historically black high schools, so why not send them to HBCUs? And the reason is because we want them to feel what it feels like to matter on campus as well. It doesn't mean that we're against PWIs. Quite frankly, what we recognize is many of our children, when they get to HBCUs, they get a sense of self that even we in our communities could not provide for them. They get to see the other part of the black experience, not just the poverty and challenges of the black experience, but intellect and, and, and compelling academic experiences that are rich and, and, and so much a part of what it is that young people who get to explore that um, get to see. King, I want to give you the last word on this because you are the future Thank and you. you are working with future leaders in terms of the, the young men um, that you're working with. What are your goals for your school and what is the vision that you have for black education in this country? Sure, um, well for many of the young men in our program I believe in developing habits. Uh, I served time in the Marine Corps and uh, some of the habits that I built uh, there um, I transferred to some of the students because the way in which they taught us um, it made some things that I do now I can't stop doing because of the habits they built and I believe that habits build character and character makes the man uh, so they'll have routines every day and um, this will be a boarding school so they'll have routines such as waking up at a certain time working out at a certain time when they first get to our school they have an initial strength test we'll see how many pull-ups they can do how far they can run body body fat etc those are physical things then we'll check their academics etc we want to create a full man by the time they graduate uh, from school and many of the young men uh, that I've worked with you know whom have records and violent uh, offenses etc these children are you know angels um, around me and our program it's just many of them have a horrible environment that they're around and so for many boys who are fatherless and uh, you know don't have any men around they're gonna mimic whatever man they see around um, and whether that be somebody you know who's like me or that be somebody else out there and I believe every man should be responsible for some children that are not his because um, how do you consider yourself a full father and you're not in the community where your child has to grow up um, so I think that's uh, important but for our students you know we want to create a full man uh, create husbands, fathers, and protectors for their community. Um, that's something I believe in wholeheartedly. Uh, so we have many different things they'll be doing at our school, such as band, firearms training, chorus, uh, martial arts, um, general contracting, automotive repair. These are things they'll be doing on a weekly basis, even swimming. Um, our boys don't know how to swim, so they'll be doing that on a weekly basis also. Uh, so just all of these different things, you know, combined into education for them to start in sixth grade and go all the way to 12th grade. By the time they graduate from school, they'll be unstoppable. Well, you're doing amazing work, as are the rest of our panelists. Thank, Thank you all for your time. We really appreciate you joining us for this conversation. And as we observe Juneteenth today with celebrations, food, drink, family and friends, maybe some cookouts, let's remember to honor our ancestors and to think of them as they endured a life of slavery and suffering. Thank you to our awesome guests who have given us much more than a wake up call. They gave us the tools to start doing what we can to make our lives more successful. Again, we'd like to say thank you to our presenting sponsor, Walmart, whose Live Better You program continues to help HBCU graduates tackle one of society's most complex challenges of preventing student debt by allowing associates to achieve career mobility and economic stability by covering 100% of program tuition and books. That's amazing. In 2021, Walmart added three leading historically black colleges and universities to the slate of Walmart's Live Better You academic partners. I need you to believe. Believe, believe, but believe better. Because see, in all of my glory and my accolades, I am my ancestors' least expectation. But my ancestors aren't what you expected. Not a successful businessman, an elected official, or a savory gentleman. Imagine the frail, innocent frame of a herdsman, a young village boy, who regarded shelter to cover his head because he knew 
it was better to protect his mind than his body, but created and built up families and nations and tribes with nothing less than skin and bone. I need you to believe because you rather believe that my ancestors were lowly men, given anonymous names by a self-proclaimed deity called America, and couldn't separate the hue of their skin tone from their shackles. Three-fifths of a human being less than a man. I need you to believe that these people, this blood and bones of a people, created mathematics in their sleep and taught nations for centuries how to stand upright before they ever knew the taste and color of your own languages. I need you to believe, believe better. I need you to believe, believe better in us. That was poet Namdi Okafor with a powerful word about black genius and ingenuity. Continuing the entertainment portion of our program with a musical selection is the wonderfully talented Kenyon Dixon. Let me hear y'all say black lives, they matter. Here, say black lives, they matter. Let me hear you say black lives, they matter. Black lives, they matter, yeah. If I gotta break a couple necks just to get a little respect, that's what I'm gonna do. You try to put me to the test, better hit me with your best, now I want you. You see they love it when you own one, never when you own, that's why I stay cool. So welcome to the show, front row, you can have a seat, you and your whole crew, yeah. You won't smoke, I'm a fire. Never burn it out, though. Don't, don't care who against me. Still to the top, so deaf to the haters. I don't need the clout. No, 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 no. See, my mom used to tell me, just let them talk, because your actions be louder than words from their mouth, so they'll get the picture. Of but time's running down, yeah. I know you hate it. You hate to see it. Because I ain't leaving. Because I ain't leaving. No. Ain't going. You really hate to see, yeah, you really hate to see, yeah. You hate, you hate to see it. Cause I ain't leaving. Cause I ain't leaving. Yeah. I'm staying right here. Say, oh, you feel the way? What you mad for? You know I say all the way. See, we just want reparations. I'll come to more money, no problems and haters. Show them bad love and they still try to break it. But you don't have to hide. Smoke, I'm a fire. Never burn it out though. Don't care who against me. Still to the top, so deaf to the haters. Prosecute the cops. No, 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 no. See, my mom used to tell me, just let them talk, cause your actions speak louder than me. But some they'll get the picture. My time's running down, yeah. I know you hate you hate to see it. Cause I ain't leaving. Cause I ain't leaving. No. I know you really hate to see, yeah, you really hate to see, yeah. You hate, you hate to see. Cause I ain't leaving. I ain't leaving. I'm staying right. Said you hate to see. Instead of compete, but you mad. 
Yeah, you big man. You really trying really hard. You on your riffraff. Got your chest all poked out. Oh, you a big man. You hate to see it. How did I get here? Aggressively reciting oral African traditions and history while perched on the back of a great elephant. Listening to Fela Kuti and Burner Boy while drinking native palm wine out of a golden gauntlet. Gold mine from the mountains of our children's smiles while washing my nappy, natural black hair in the river Niger. I am arrogantly black. I am every hue of blackness from apple stem brown to midnight darkness. I am a pinstripe suit the color of rhythm and blues while having an oversized velvet bow tie. I am humble and pompous. I am educated and street smart. I am the Queen's English recited in an urban colloquial verbiage. I am safe to be around and dangerous. I am collard greens eaten with a salad fork. The prophets foretold of a child who did not feel the warmth of the village would come one day to burn it down. And we've been giving away culture for free. And no more will we give culture away for free because even though we were born with this black skin, this black skin costs me. I know you hate to see this. Hate to see a black boy in love with his skin. All this arrogance and intolerance, I know you hate to see it. I know you hate to see it. That was another bold and unapologetically black word from the inspiring poet Namdi Okafor. And now we turn our attention to our final music selection by the beautiful and talented up and coming artist, Alex Isley. Fuck. 
a talent. And I want to thank all the artists and our amazing guests who contributed to this special. Happy Juneteenth, everyone, and have a great night.